Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that through doctors and nurses, medicine and technology, you reveal yourself in magnificent ways. We know that men and women become your hands and feet, whether they realize it or not. And we pray for those who we hold close to our hearts and ask, O oh God, that you would offer that you would offer peace, comfort, so that, O oh God, we can be confident in you. Over the next few moments, we know that uh, um, we're expecting God, the Holy Spirit, to just illumine our hearts and our minds. And we pray, O oh God, that you would allow our hearts to be receptive. And what is from you, may it stick to our hearts, and what is not from you, may it fall to the ground and shatter. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So, how many people have read 1 John? Okay, yeah, a lot of us have, have read 1 John. And, and, and look, when, when I was um, a teenager, one of the things that I did was take a small book. And I didn't choose 3 John or Philemon or Obadiah or one of those books. But uh, I think it was James, or it might have been 1 John. I'm, to be honest with you, I, really, I think it was 1 John. And what I did was I read the book every day for 30 days. Just read it. It took 20 minutes to read. And so every day I just read the same book over and over again for 30 days. And what was amazing was, is that, was how each time I read it, something new actually jumped off the pages at me. And, and, and this, is, this is what's exciting about the Word of God. I believe that what God does is that He actually sends His Holy Spirit, which He promised to do in John chapter 14, to remind us of all the things that Jesus has taught us, and then to teach us, and this is the most significant thing in my opinion, to teach us the significance of that to our hearts and our minds and our lives. So that each time that I read it, and each time you read a passage of Scripture, what happens is you start to see it through the lens of what you're going through right now. Maybe one morning I got up and I forgot to make my bed. And my, I came home from school and my mom was irate, which seemed to be more often than not. But, I'm just teasing, um, but, but to read through the passage of Scripture through the lens of what I was going through at that moment. This morning, um, I, 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 being married for 26 years to Lisa, I have recognized the nuances of what makes her upset. And um, when she starts talking to herself, that is a green light or a red light. Just don't go any further. She'll just start talking to herself. This morning, she forgot where she put her coffee. And you, it, it was in the pantry. I don't know why it was in there. But, but I, I mentioned, I said, well, let me just make you a new cup. I don't have any more creamer. I mean, it was just like this cup of coffee became the most significant thing. And, and whatever we go through at moments in our lives, we actually are seeing the Scripture. We are recognizing glimpses of God's grace through the lenses, if we let it, through the lenses through which we actually live. And so these letters, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, when you consider them together, they, uh, it is apparent that, um, that there, is few, there are few books that are more loved or memorized or quoted than 1 John. And in, at the same time, 
you one is hard pressed to find any books of scripture most ignored or less taught than second john or third john maybe philemon is right up there or obadiah as i mentioned earlier but to neglect them as a whole as a corpus first second and third john to ignore them is to miss that more complete picture that the Holy Spirit wished to to give us, to show us when he moved John to actually write these three. Martin Luther writes this, this, specifically 1 John, this is an outstanding epistle, a wonderful letter. It has John's style and manner of expression so beautifully and gently as he gives us the most perfect picture of Jesus. The perfect picture of Jesus. Now, as I, I want you to kind of hold on to that because like I said, it's going to be drinking like from a fire hydrant today. But I am not so moved to get through all the material as it is for us to discuss. So I want us to stop me and, and, and we'll kind of go through. But, but what I want to do is, is I want to just give a brief introduction to the book 1 John to kind of prepare us for 2nd and 3rd John in the weeks that follow. I want to give us a, a, a brief introduction and then I want to take some of the highlights of the book. And again, we're not going to get through them all. But I will list them for you so that you can look them over and start to get this picture also. Now, it is possible, as you consider any book to study, it is possible to read a book without understanding why the book was written. I mentioned on Sunday in my sermon that there are a lot of, there are a lot of reasons why people write a book. Some do it because their job depends upon it. Some do it because um, it's a good thing to write. And that, that's true. It, it, you know, whether it's putting, learning how to put your thoughts into words it, it, and making sure that you're conveying the thought, the initial intention through your written words. It's one thing to speak. It's another thing to write them. But there are some other folks who just love to see their name written on a page. They want, they, it's like an ego trip in one way or another. Um, and I don't know if we have Dewey Decimal Systems anymore or numbers, you know, card catalogs. But they wanted to see their name next to a Dewey Decimal. If you want to see a Dewey Decimal number, you can go to our library. Faith Curran, is, she has it memorized, okay? I'm telling you. And, um, but, but, but when you want to just read a book, it's okay to not know why the book was written. But if you want to study a book, if you want to dig deep into that, a book, then you, it really helps to know why the book was written. Many times in seminary when I would read books and we'd have to write on these books, I would go ahead and read the preface or the foreword because in the foreword or the preface, Nine times out of ten, the author is going to tell you exactly why he or she is writing that book. And it's wonderful. So at least you know what to look for in that. And so what John does is that he, uh, he actually um, unfolds for us that, that the reason why he writes this book, and, and this is why it's so... Um, so valuable to us, he doesn't hide behind anything when he wants to, wants to reveal what he's writing about. So, <clears throat> what, what, is, so the, what you get then is the problems 1 John addresses. The problems 1 John addresses are very similar to the problems of our own time. And the objectives that he addresses, the objectives that he addresses, are objectives that Christians today must also have if they are to grow in their faith or if the, and if they are to 
continue to present that gospel message to the people they come in contact with. So, why was 1 John written? In 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, I don't know why he does this, but he puts the perp. If I was looking in the preface for it, I would not have found it. He does this in John's gospel, his gospel too. He waits to chapter 20 to tell why he wrote it. This is what he wants to, uh, to do here. And, and what he does is that he actually, um, uh, he actually identifies who his audience is. I write to those of you who believe in the name of the Son of God. And what he's doing here is he's, he's saying, look, who's... Okay, let me ask you. Today, we don't say... Those people over there believe in the name of the Son of God. Okay, what do we say? We call these people Christians, right? So who is he writing to? Christians. People who go to church every Sunday. People who come to Bible study. People who have devotions, okay? People who are, are not needing to be converted. So th these, this, is, this is what's exciting. that he, This is a book for us. Okay, this is a book for us, and you're going to see why this is so important for us in this very next phrase, because this is not just the only part of the verse. The next one is this, that he says, I'm writing these things to you Christians so that, and any time you see the word so that or in order to, it is, there is a, it's called causation, where he, this is the effect that he wants to happen. So the cause is I'm writing these things. The effect, anytime you see so that, you can already say, okay, there, where's the cause? Where's the effect? This is the effect. So that you may know that you have eternal life. Notice it does not say what? that you will know. Thank you. It doesn't say that. It says it's possible to know that you will have eternal life. And this word right here, no. Very, very uh, um, interesting word in, in the original language. And I'm not going to get into it, but what's interesting is you will see this throughout the book, this word. So when we start looking at certain passages, you're going to see him say, I want you to know, I want you to know, I want you to know, I want you to know. Yeah, you can say, I want you to no. Okay, there you go. And, and, and I want you to, to see exactly what I'm trying to do. And then at the end, it's as if you've studied my book. Did you get it? Do you understand why I wrote this book? I want you to know that you have eternal life. Now, you can contrast this with John chapter 20, verse 31, which is the, uh, the statement of purpose in John's gospel. He starts in verse 30. Jesus did so many other things that I didn't even write about, too many that if they were written together, they would there would be not enough books to fill them all. But I have chosen these. But these I have rigorously selected are written. There we go. So that the effect, the cause was I chose these seven things. The effect is that you may believe. Not that you will believe. It's subjunctive. It's, it's a possibility. It's a possibility that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. And by believing, you may have life in his name. Where 1 John is written to Christians, John's gospel is written to non-Christians, okay? That you may believe, and by believing, you may have life in His name, all right? So, 
you can start to see that the contrast is going here. That First John, his purpose is, is to lead those who already believe to a confidence. That, a confidence in that which they already possess. Now this is interesting to me. Who knows, as I set this up, the interesting part. Who knows our mission statement at St. Paul? Don't embarrass me now. Come on. I'm not going to give you that word. There you go. Thank you. It's like hangman, okay? All right. Faith of the people. To grow the faith of the people. That's what we do. That's our purpose. Now, what's interesting about this is, is that, that this is a process where we, on one hand, begin with little confidence in God and we begin to become more confident in God. All right? And we do this we have hijacked some words. Christians have hijacked words. I remember um, born again. Born again. We know what it means, but we really don't know what it is. A lot of people. Are you born again? My dad, when I wanted to go into ministry, he said, tell me about your call. Well, my call? Dad, you haven't even put a phone line into my room. I'm, that's back when we didn't have cell phones, okay? I don't even have a phone line. What are you talking about? A call. But he came from that generation that, that there was a calling that you had into ministry. A call. Tell me your call. So those, those aren't really hijacked. But this is a word that has been hijacked. Or belief. Now, nowhere else in English conversation... Do we misunderstand what believe means? But in the Christian world, we kind of like, uh, I'm not sure. Nobody asks when you say, do you believe that this chair will hold you up? Nobody asks, well, I, I haven't sat in it really. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it looks sturdy. I mean, I've fallen off it once before. Maybe it was my fault. Maybe it was some, no. We usually just say, without even a thought, we just plop right down. Oh, that would have been really funny if it broke. <laughs> I came down kind of hard on that thing right there, and thank you. Okay. Um, and we, 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 don't, we don't even think about it, but if somebody comes to a preacher or to you, and, and, and I'm going through a difficult time, I don't know if God is there, what do we say? You just got to believe, brother. You just got to believe, sister. You got to believe more. You got to have more faith. How much more? I mean, is, is, it, is it really, can it be more, can it be less subjective, this belief? I mean, so I don't think that these words, faith and belief, were intended to be kind of um, understood any other way outside of our common understanding of it. I mean, this is, this is something that we, we, uh, we, we use all the time. So it's not that you might not believe enough. There's something else that's going on. And I think this is what John actually tackles in this passage, in this book. That, 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 that um, the gospel, that 1 John was written to lead those who already believe. Not to believe more. Not to have 10% more faith. But to a confidence. Ah, you see, the, the idea of belief is to have a natural effect. And this is the problem that we sometimes, 
We see this as an action. I got to believe more. I got to believe more. But we never get to the effect of what it's supposed to lead into. Confidence. Certainty. Trust. You might still have some skepticism. But the thing is, is that even a little bit of faith the size of a mustard seed should have some effect that we do walk out on faith. Anybody, don't raise your hand, but there are some people who are afraid to fly. And they, they, they will not. And it's not about them not believing that somebody is capable it's not about somebody that believing that the statistics say that it are in our favor of making it to our destination. They have not put any confidence in that belief. They have not put any certainty in that belief. They have not put any trust in that belief. And so you can start to see that the problem here is that there is no living into or leaning into what we believe. And that is what, and when I say we, I don't mean this small band of believers. I'm just saying people. We, we have this thing. Now, Paul does this so well. Two times, two, that's actually four. Two times, two times, he does this in the passages. Philippians 4, 11. And maybe 4, 7. Anyways, He's in prison, and he writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. And if you didn't hear me the first time, I'll say it again. Rejoice! A few verses later, he says, Be anxious about nothing, but in everything, with prayer and petition, make your requests known to God. It is 11. Make your requests known to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind. Now, if you don't believe that that's happening, the effect is anxiety still. If you don't live into it, if you don't allow that to be true for you, it might be intellectually true, it might be true on Sunday mornings or Tuesday mornings, but to live into it at Thursday, on Thursdays at 4.45 p.m., will you have the ability to live into that confidence? But here's the neat thing. A few verses later, I think it's verse 11, he says this, in all things, I have learned to be content. I have learned to be content. So this effect his, was contentment. That is something that is learned. That's why this stuff is you may. It's a possibility. It's an invitation that we can have this assurance. Another time he does this is in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and following. He, very popular, praying, Jesus says to him, my is sufficient, my grace, come on, we can do it. My grace is sufficient for you. My power will be made perfect or complete in your weakness. And when he quotes what Jesus told him, he says, so, which means he's going to tell you the effect. So, I have learned to be okay with, this is my own words, with the stonings, with the poverty, with the hatred that people have against me. I have learned, this is, so I will be this way because... In my weakness, Christ is, Christ's power is perfected in me. To have confidence is 1 John's purpose. That believers may know, can know, should know, that they are children of God. And this is not unique to John. Although John's the only writer to commit a whole book to this, 
There are other passages in the Scriptures that unfold this, this idea of you can have certainty. I'm not going to go into them, but 1 Thessalonians 1.5 speaks of this. Hebrews 10.21 speaks about this. And there's an inkling in the Bible that we can know, but it's, it's only John's Gospel that we or John's letter that has been devoted to this entire thing, okay? Now, why does John want to write this intentional letter about knowing? Obviously, what? The people he's writing to don't, they don't have it. They don't know for sure, okay? So he sees a group of people who don't know, and he says, let me tell you, you can know, you may know, you should know, and let me tell you why. So th there's this, in, early in, the in this letter, you, you see that there was this group of people that he talks about that uh, have been um, teaching something different. They withdrew themselves from the church. They wanted to start a new church, and they claimed it was an improvement. Now, come on. That was written 2,000 years ago. This could have been written today. I mean, we all look around for the improvement. You know, we, my, my children want the new iPhone. Your iPhone works fine. You, you don't need a new one. Yeah, Dad, but it's improved. It's new. Um, and, and so when these people moved out and they, they started their new fellowship, they claimed it was an improvement. And so naturally, what happens to the people who are left in the original? They start asking questions. I wonder if these new teachers are right. I wonder if our, we should abandon this old teaching. Where does the truth lie? And, and then the big thing is this. Have we missed it all along? Maybe we're not Christians at all. Now, here's the neat thing about the 21st century Protestant church. Every single church that's Protestant and Roman Catholic, we have this standard that we will go to the mat for. Does anybody know what it is? Do, 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 do. Huh? It's, gee, well, yes, but what, what do we, what is, what do we say that we affirm this historic confession of the Christian church? Apostles' Creed, yeah, or the Nicene Creed. We have, this is what we go to the mat for. So even though there are differences of denominations and churches because that, that have broken off because the color of the paint's wrong or the cushions are not as soft or that person has a drum set or they're wearing flip-flops or whatnot, I mean, that's all non-essential, all right? But the Apostles' Creed, that's, that's what we stick to, okay? They didn't have that then at that time, but... Um, and maybe I'm not sure if they would have uh, uh, been able to hold on, but here is the, the questions that these people have. In short, they were asking themselves this question left in their fellowship as this new group, more intellectual group, moves out and says that they know more. How could one know when he or she was truly a child of God? not like we pull out our wallet and say, here, I'm a card-carrying member of the Jesus group. We don't get a new birth certificate with our parents' name scratched off and says God, because I'm a child of God. But this is a really real question. Or you could say, how could a believer know when he or she was born again? And so this is why John writes this book. These people called Gnostics were coming in and they were trying to mutilate the faith of the apostles that had delivered. And, and, and in doing so, left a lot of questions. So Paul or John writes, I write these things to you who believe in the name so that you may know that you are the son of God or that a child of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And I'm not going to write or read these all, um, but I'll just write up here references. Just assume they're 1 John 2, 5, 
213, 220, 221, 32, 314, there's more, turn the page, 319, 324, 44, 413, 52, and 518 through 20. Every single one of those is John saying, I want you to know, or some rendition of it. So he populates the whole book with this, I want you to know, I want you to know, I want you to know, or you can know, I want you to know, this is what I want you to know, no, 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 no. And at the end, did you miss it? I write these things to those who believe in the Son of God, the name, so that you may know that you have eternal life. And if, here's here's the interesting, here is the fascinating thing. If this is true, and if they apply to Christians living in all periods of history, then they are of great importance today. For there is hardly an age that has not been fraught with confusion and uncertainty more than today. Today's world puts a high premium on knowledge and on the confidence it is supposed to bring. We all agree that knowledge is important. To know, no, no, no. To knowledge is important. And the people that we frequent for services rendered want that we want them to know. And in fact, in one thing, we want them to know the latest and the greatest. Every doctor we see, we want them to know the newest technology, the newest procedures, the newest medicine. We want them to be aware of these things. We don't want to go to a doctor who doesn't use Novocaine, but gives you a a stick to bite on and a shot of whiskey for your anesthesia. Are you right? Are you with me? All right, yes, we, we want a doctor to use anesthesia. All right, we want them to know these things. And, and, um, but there is one thing that we're not expecting them to do is go outside of what their higher purpose is, their Hippocratic oath or whatnot is to heal and not hurt. And that's the same for us. It's okay to learn some new things. It's good to dive in. But as long as we are aware that it is not pulling us away from the confidence and the trust of what God reveals to us through Jesus Christ and the Scriptures. Any questions? Because we're about to jump right in. Any questions or comments? Snide remarks. Okay, so I ask you this. What is Christianity? I'm not going to ask you to answer that right now. There was an interview, who, an interviewer who went out to the streets of Philadelphia and asked common people, what is Christianity? Yeah, well, you probably say that, Betty, because it's from the north. Pennsylvania, right? You wouldn't get that on the streets of the South. No, I'm just teasing you. Well, some, might, some said, well, it's the American way of life. That's what Christianity is. Or it's an organization. Or some with a more negative, oh, it's a tool to repress the poor. Who is Jesus was the second question. Some said a pu- the pure essence of energy. Wow. That's real mystic. A good man, our leader. Some said, I'm not sure, I just don't know. The problem faced by this interviewer was similar to the problem faced by John, but the difference was that the people he was writing to were Christians. 
So what we would do is we would walk through the halls of our churches and ask, who is Jesus and what is Christianity? What answer would we get? We hope, we hope. Many of you know, for 22, 23 years, my wife and I spent in youth ministry. And one of the things, I want to be careful how I say this, because I have many things that I'd like to say, but I don't, I won't. And I may. (laughs) I just don't have a filter between my brain and my mouth anymore. We are convinced that there's a problem in in the church. Statistics tell us that it is more likely people that come to Christ come to Christ in faith during their teenage years than someone who is in their 80s. Statistics, if these statistics are right, say that one out of seven come to Christ during their teenage years. And if you're 80, the chances are one in 800,000. And that's sad. I mean, but it gives us this grand and opening fertile ground. And, um, and while we were in youth ministry, we saw active people, kids, who were there every week, and they would come, and they would serve, and they would do mission trips and stuff like that. And, and then for some reason, when they went to college, they left the faith. Some, many, thankfully, only did it temporarily. At that time, the temporary time was two to three years. Now, it's 11 years. If people are going to come back, it's 11 years later that they come back, the majority of folks. Now, so we were thinking, I mean, as we were raising our kids, and and now we have teenagers, and we sat our kids down the other day, not Katie. We sat sat them down, and, and... we shared this information with them. And then we shared as parents, we said, we don't want this to happen to you. And Lisa and I were, were talking beforehand, we just, how did that happen? I mean, there's probably 50 different things we could point to, but from a youth minister, what could, we, what, what, what could I put my finger on? And, we don't know if this is right or not, but this is the conclusion we came to. That there are people, youth, and maybe even people our ages, that have an extravagant public faith. Everybody knows where they are on Sunday. And I was talking to my children. I said, John, you teach a Bible study for high school senior or high school uh, boys. And, and Anna, you play in the worship band here, and you teach a middle school girls Bible study. And, 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 and you know, that's a public thing. But what I think sustains us is our private faith. What do I mean by private faith? At home. Your devotions. Your memorizing scripture. Your discipline. Your discipline to know the difference between right and wrong and living into it. See, Christianity isn't Christianity when everybody's watching. Christianity is Christianity even when no one's watching. And so I think that what John might allude to in one way or another, or at least this problem of knowing or assurance, has to be centered somewhere around this idea of knowing what the private, or at least feeding that private thing, that private faith. 
Huey Goddard actually told me that. Who Huey is a um, he was the master youth pastor when I was a youth. We read his books. We went to conferences where he spoke. I asked him to come down and speak to a youth group and parents when I was in Louisiana. And I, I wanted to because I wanted to get a, just a couple minutes with him. And, and you know what he said when I asked him? I said, what can you give me as advice? What do you want to tell me? I'm new. I'm green. Mold me. Tell me what to do. And he said, John, it's not about what you do as my pen is poised, ready to take notes. See, what I do is public. He said, what you focus on is that well inside of you, that spring inside of you, the Holy Spirit inside of you. Feed that, and everything else will fall into place. Our very own John Wesley. Ever heard of him? Cool guy. John Wesley said, I just set myself on fire, and people will come and watch me burn. Isn't that exciting? Not literally, but spiritually. I'm going to set myself on fire. I'm going to feed that fire. What Paul says to Timothy, fan into flame what your mother and grandmother has sown into you. Fan into flame. Not go out and feed the poor. Not go out and lead studies and worship. That's great and everything. But this without this falls away. This melts. And so the difference here is that this is being written to Christians. And people need to get this right idea of who Jesus is. We're about to have a break, but hang in there for one second. Remember this guy, C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity? You guys didn't do Mere Christianity. All the studies that I study on Mere Christianity, we get to book three, and then everybody kind of like says, oh, okay. Well, this is in book two. It's chapter four or five. It's a great passage. I'm not trying to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I do not accept his claim to be God. You see, if he's a good moral teacher, then we'll follow him in public. But if he's God, we'll follow him in private. That is one thing that we must not say. A man who, has mere, who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg. I love his imagery. Or else he would be the devil of hell. You see why? Because a good person who is not God does not call himself God. You must make a choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that option up to us. He never did. He, ne he did not intend to. So these questions that the people of John are going through was, who are we, what is truth, and who is right? And this is what John tackles in the opening verses that we will jump into right after our break. We'll give you all 10 minutes, okay?
or begin, no matter. So, ladies, I went ahead and uh, listed over here all the passages of Scripture of note that um, uh, go ahead and, and maybe write down and over the next few days uh, review them and study them. Um, but I want to, uh, I want to um, jump in here. Uh, to 1 John uh, chapter 1. And as I ended the last one, it's the last section, it's in these first couple chapters that, um, that John tackles the questions. This, this whole idea of uh, the, what the Gnostics had brought their way. And unlike many letters, and the typical way in first century to write a letter, John jumps right in. He, um, and, and, and for him, as you will see in these first several verses, the most important thing is Jesus. Jesus, and without Jesus, there is no Christianity. And, and as Malcolm Muggridge said, it's Christ or nothing. There was a book written by a minister in Florida that says, that was titled, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And so what, Jesus, what John is doing here is, is he wants, he's, he's setting the stage or the foundation that the first step to knowing that you are a child of God and to knowing who you are in, God, in, in Christ is to begin with who Jesus is, who Jesus is. And he does this in um, a very uh, um, interesting way. So he starts out by saying um, that which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen, and we have touched. He, get, he starts out here for um, setting the stage as he is a, a, uh, an eyewitness. And, and the way he does it is he, he says to his readers, or he writes to his readers that the channel for you to know that I am a first century eyewitness to what I'm about to say is using these three things. What I have heard, what I have seen, what I have touched. What do you see that is f peculiar about these three things and the order that John uses? It gets more intimate. It gets more intimate, yes. And each offers more credibility. 
I can tell you something, and whether you believe it or not is up to you. And it has something to do with me and my credibility. But even if I just tell you something, which he is doing here, he is going to tell something, he wants them to also know that I, he has credibility, that he is also seen and he is also touched. I, I worked in a funeral home um, when I was in college. And, and in fact, I, I lived there. And um, we, there was about five or six of us that would live up on the third floor, and we got free room if we worked there and we got paid to work there and stuff like that the beds were a little hard but needless to say um but anyways <laughs> yeah, no, it's not that kind of bed slayed we actually had mattresses and beds and stuff but um the owner his name was john also and mr freivogel would say um he would always ask the question going to the funeral before we left for the funeral he would say is the church truck in the hearse. The church truck is the uh, cart that you roll. You can use to roll the casket in and out of the uh, the sanctuary, and um, and he would never be satisfied with anyone just saying, "Yes, it's there." He would also say, "Have you seen it?" And so we'd have to go and. Open up the door and open up the little compartment and say, yep, it's there. But then he would say, have you touched it? Because there was, if you, if you say it's there, to you saying we have seen it, you now find yourself being more believable if you have actually touched it. So we would always respond, yes, two people have seen it and one, per one person has touched it. Is the church truck there? Yes. Two people seen it, one person touched it. Two people seen it, one person touched it. And so it, it offers a little bit of, of credibility of this. And it's this, this third one here that offers, as uh, Mary Sue said, the most intimacy. Now, going back to John's Gospel, tell me an incident that only John records that shows this intimacy after the resurrection Thomas. Thomas touched the wound but notice his question when the disciples said we have seen him what did he say they were here he heard what they said but he says unless I see it nay, unless I touch the wounds I will not believe and notice when Jesus saw him the next week he is offered this invitation, put your finger here. Notice what he doesn't do. Thomas never does it. He, what he does, is, as John records, is he falls to the ground and he says, my Lord and my God. But it's interesting that, that some people are wired this way, that they have, they, have to, uh, they have to touch this or they have to do this. Um, and, and so what we get here is um, um, uh, one other thing that seems to be uh, uh, accentuated is this we have seen. Because it is repeated throughout this several times. We have seen, we have seen, we have seen. Over and over and over again, you see this, we have seen. Well, what have they seen? This is what he focuses on concerning the word of life. Now, if you want to put them in tandem, the gospel and this, this passage, um, you uh, are invited to, to be um, reminded of, of certain passages in John's gospel that, uh, uh, that he mentions about this um, in 114 of John's gospel says the word became flesh and and dwelt in our neighborhood or pitched his tent in our neighborhood um, tabernacled is the actual 
word. Um, there's this, but but First John is using this word of life. All right, and so this word of life then becomes um, a, a, a descriptive of of who Jesus is. That this is the message that became flesh. This is the message that is life and offers life. So Christ is, is uh, life-giving. Christ is uh, the one who is, um, the, gives life. Uh, in, in John chapter 11, uh, verse 25, he says to both Martha and Mary on separate occasions, I am the resurrection and the life. John 10.10, 10, I have come so that you may have life and have it more abundantly. John 14.6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, and so uh, what you start to see here is who this Jesus is, is he is the one who is the, the life. But in verse 2, he ends this... Um, let me see here where I'm at. Okay, yeah, eternal life. He, he says that this life, this life right here, the one he's talking about, this, the life was made manifest, that became flesh, and we have seen it, we testify, we proclaim to you, the, we, what we're proclaiming to you is this eternal life, okay? And later on he mentions that this is the one who is light, all right? And again, going back to John chapter 1, that uh, what Christianity has is life. And, and uh, um, the, the life of Jesus himself as creator, sustainer, has, has life and is also a giver of light. That is what John 1.4 says and what, he, what John 1.4 kind of dives into. So then he says, what we're doing with this word, what we're doing is we are proclaiming it to you. We are proclaiming. We testify to it. We proclaim. We, uh, that we, we proclaim that you may have fellowship and with our fellowship with each other and um, make our joy complete. Now, what's interesting here is we start to see what the objective is of him, of Christ's becoming or his writing, and that is that... Um, that so that this is this is the uh, the cause I'm writing so that you may have fellowship with us and fellowship with the Father and with His Son. Two things: fellowship, fellowship. Now, this is this is interesting because when when I'm kind of letting this um, uh, unfold. Uh, in my heart and my mind, I mean, I'm thinking, is there a sense in my own heart, in my own life, where I am skeptical about my relationship with somebody based on, um, based on my interpretation of my own thoughts or my own feelings or my own disbelief or my distrust or my lack of confidence? In other words, um, when Lisa and I married, one of the things that um, someone had said is marriage is, a, is, is, you know, for life and all that kind of stuff. But he said, love is a choice. He said, you might have fallen in love based on attraction, but you will remain in love based on choice. Based on choice. There are times, like this morning, when I thought I could have said something that would have gotten me a swift kick outside with the dog. Okay? There were, I could have said something that could have just like, well, I'll show you. You know, you don't know where your coffee is. You don't have any more creamer. Who did the lack of planning there? Oh, I wish I could grab those words back. <laughs> Things that I wanted to say. But I didn't. I didn't say them. Um, and, and mainly I didn't say them because um, I chose not to. 
I knew better. Um, I, 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 um, I knew that our relationship wasn't based on circumstantial things like coffee, like me making the bed, like me putting the cap back on the toothpaste. It was based on choice. It's based on choice. And so when I, when I look at this, there are certain things that the way that John, the nuances that John unfolds here with fellowship, fellowship's a choice. So fellowship is something that we have an opportunity to live into. And, and it, is, it is something that is uh, given to us as a, uh, as a venue to um, commune and to realize the choice that God has made to deliberately and intentionally invite us into his kingdom. And that comes from the fellowship, that comes from. So when he says this, I write these things so that you may have fellowship with us, so that we would be of like mind. But I want you to know it's not just about us gathering together. It's us gathering together. So as the Hebrew, like the writer of Hebrews says, so that we will become more confident, even as the day we become encouraged, even as the day is approaching. So there's a lot of things here that go on with this whole idea of why John's writing this. But the objectives here that kind of unfold is that we want to have this fellowship that we and it will bring our joy as complete. Now, the way he does this is how he shares this gospel is he testifies. I'm telling you, I'm proclaiming. These are things that are, he says that he is doing. People come to him and ask him questions. Tell me about that time when Jesus did this. Or tell me about that time when Jairus' daughter was ro- risen from the dead. Tell me about that time, what it was like to stand outside Lazarus' tomb. And he would testify. He would be a testimony to it. But not only did he testify to it, he proclaimed something. He said something of truth. He said, this is who God is. I witness it. I am a firsthand eyewitness. I have seen it, touched it. I have heard it. These things are true. I'm an eyewitness. But the proclamation is, what difference will that make in your life? That that invitation for transformation of change. I testify to it. We proclaim it. What is that you want to have happen? Of course, We do this in our sanctuaries and worship. We don't get up and say, um, every time Shane or I speak from the pulpit or we are preaching, it is centered around this idea of proclamation. Because what we want is this change that happens in our lives. That we start to see things differently. And what John is doing is, is this becomes an introduction to knowing that you are who God says you are. This becomes an introduction to it, a foundation. To understand is that there is this proclamation, this transformation that happens. But he testifies, he proclaims, and then he writes. I'm writing to you. This is the, uh, the idea of, of, of this unfolding in our hearts, in our minds. We proclaim, we have fellowship, and, um, and then as he uh, continues here, he, um, let me unfold this for a second and move up a verse. This message, that's that gospel message, which we have heard, we proclaim to you, that, here it is, God is light. And in him there is no darkness. Now there are a series of conditional statements. This is the main thought that he kind of leans into. I I want you to know that I have seen this. I heard it. I proclaimed it. I testify. I'm an eyewitness. We have touched it. All this kind of stuff. But this is what I want you to know. God is light. Now later on he's going to say in chapter 4, God is love. Okay? But... That's later on. But right now, God is light. This is the message, the main thought. 
Now he says, now he kind of works backwards with a, a series of conditional statements that, that begin with if. If we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in the darkness, we lie. Now, but if we walk in the light, what? What's the light? God. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. I, I like this idea, this metaphor of walking in the light. If you think in the light, no. If you believe in the light, mm -mm. if you have faith in the light, mm -mm, no. There's some action that's going on here. There's some effect. Now, I didn't come up with this, but it's from Francis Chan. And, and I'll use this because I think this is the greatest analogy of how people today, younger people today, maybe even some of people we know, um, live into walking in the light. If I tell my daughter, if I say to Anna Claire, go upstairs, we don't have an upstairs, but go into your room and clean your room. If I say that to her, and she says to me, yes, Dad, and she walks into her room, closes the door, and she spends three hours in there all along, I'm thinking, boy, this room is going to be spick and span. She comes out and she says to me, I ask her, I said, Anna, have you cleaned your room? And she says, well, Dad, let me tell you. Oh, there is a mistake. I ask her a yes or no question, and he, she doesn't offer me that. Okay, that's neither here nor there. But she says to me, Dad, I want you to know that I thought about what you asked me to do. In fact, Dad, I want you to know that I have called some of my closest friends, and we're going to come together tonight, and we are going to discuss what you asked me to do. You're laughing. Why? Why? Why are you laughing? Because you can see how absurd that is. She says, Dad, I want you to know that we have written down what you have said, and we are going to translate it for, uh, we're going to translate it, and we're going to talk about what it would be like if I cleaned my room. How wonderful it would be for me to clean my room. We are going to talk about how happy you'll be and how proud you'll be of me if I clean my room. Now, do I go up and give my daughter a great big hug and say, oh, that's exactly what I wanted you to do? I said, no. I said, turn, no. Again, she, this, is not, this is just an illustration. I said, turn around and go back in there and clean your room. This is what we do. Is this is what Christians do. This is what we see as a normal practice, that we talk about it and we discuss it and we translate it, and we memorize it, and we have small groups and wonder and discuss what it would be like if it happened, but we never do it. And this becomes one of the foundational things for us to begin to believe that we are who God says we are. Because we can... Talk about being a, that we are a child of God. We can live into the fact, we can get together and, and, and imagine what it would be like if, uh, how wonderful it is to be a child of God. But when the going gets difficult and the rains come and we, and our foundation, as in Matthew 7, uh, Jesus says, in Matthew 7, when our foundation is threatened, what do we do? What do we do? And that is the premise for knowing. Because the more you put into practice your faith in real life situations, the more you will become confident in who you are. Why? Well, in your weakness, the power, which is dunamis, which is dynamite, the power becomes 
complete or is revealed. Right? In our weakness, it is, it is this power that is, we start to see everything that God is able to do. So tell me, not tell me, think, imagine, where are you one step beyond comfortable trusting God? Because the fact of the matter is, as J. Vernon McGee, I mean, everybody ever heard of J. Vernon McGee? J. Vernon, Bible bus, five years through the Bible. When he gets on John 3.16, he talks about, or John 3, 3, and, and, and talks about belief. If I walk around this bench and I say, I believe that bench can hold me up, but I never sit in it, what am I doing? Nothing. I just have intellectual assent that that thing will hold me up. But as soon as I put my complete weight, not this, okay, all right, I'm going to lean on this leg more so I can catch myself. No, if you sit into the arms of Christ, that if he drops you, you fall. Now, I'm not talking about every single thing at the very beginning, but just maybe we could choose one thing. That if Christ drops us and lets us go, we will fall. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. When he says consider, what he, that is actually an athletic term. In the Greek, that means keep score. When you're playing soccer and you, keep a, you kick a goal, What's the first thing everybody does? They, well, yeah. Go! Okay, what's the second thing they do? They look up at the scoreboard. See who's winning. Sounds dark. But James, what Paul, what John, what most of the gospel writers, or the New Testament, the Old Testament is referring to, is this is our score. Not when everything goes right, but when everything goes wrong, what do you do? Consider, because you know, consider a pure joy when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. 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 That's what, that's what gives us, in the small things, the confidence to keep believing that God, we are who God says we are. You want, you want to increase your assurance. You want to live into, speak into somebody else's life. Ask them where they are trusting God right now. Where are they trusting that? I'm not saying that if you're sick, you don't go to a doctor. I'm actually saying what, what, to, to have confidence that God knows best that he has you in the palm of your hand, his hand. I mean, what is the whole Old Testament, especially in the Psalter, speaking about? In Psalm 91, where at the very end, he says, For those who believe in my name, I will hold them. For those who love me, I will keep them in my care. I will deliver them from all. No, no the, the whole idea is, is that God's presence is there. That what God promises is that He has not forgotten you. That He has not abandoned you. That He has not been taken by surprise. And the more on the little things that we trust God in that. And we test God in those areas. That we do what Psalm 36, 8, 34, 36, 4, 8, 8. Yeah, that's what it is. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Why? Because it's in the actual stepping into those things, those moments, that our confidence in God grows. Any questions?
So that was all centered around this idea of walking in the light as He is in light. Then we have fellowship. And the blood of Jesus cleanses our, of our, our sin. If we say we have no sin, it's like He's picking up on these themes of truth, of one another. I mean, He's picking up on these. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The, the idea here for sin, in my opinion, this is not salva- saving confession. Like when you become a Christian, you confess your sin. And you confess your need um, in Christ. I think this is, who's he writing to? Christians. When you say the Lord's Prayer, what, are, Christians say that, right? And we say, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Or we say, trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Okay, The idea there is to restore relationship. See, what we need is as we are building this idea of confidence in God, in our, in our walk with God, and, and being able to be more uh, um, secure in who God says we are, there is these moments where our relationship is broken. So when we don't trust or we don't obey and we don't do what we're asked to do and we don't, where we just talk about it and it hasn't had this effect, there is broken relationship that needs to be restored. So as we live into these moments, it's this, it's this self-reflection that we get to this point where we say, okay, God, I haven't trusted you here. Forgive me. Cleanse me from this unrighteousness and allow me, oh God, to be, to be renewed in this because I know you are faithful and I know that you will cleanse me and restore this, this relationship to me. It's a beautiful, beautiful passage, but it sets the stage as he, can, as he uh, leans into the rest of this, this book. Any uh, questions? Just very quickly. I want to uh, jump over these couple verses here. Um, actually, I'm going to do a different one. This is um, chapter 3, verse 1. This is beautiful. See what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God. See. That's another way of saying know this. The reason the world does not know this is that it does not know Him. You, are, We are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we will see him as he is. This is, if, if it's not the actual, um, the actual putting this into the test in our lives, what coupled with this is, even if God doesn't show up in our timeline, in the way we expect him to, Realize that the love that God has demonstrated for you is extravagant. That he would even invite us into this place or this, this, this opportunity that we could be called the children of God. And then that's what we are. The, way, the reason the world does not know it is because they don't know him. 1 John 2.28, later on, uh, 4, 4, 4 is a great passage. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. This is uh, 4.7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is a, for uh, everyone that loveth knoweth God. And, um, and this, what he is, John is leaning into is this whole idea of what Jesus said as the new commandment. When Jesus spoke to his disciples and said, love one another as I have loved you. 
Any question about what to do, always default to love. Default to love. And all of these things will build up your confidence and people's confidence that they are the children of God. Now, I wish we could have uh, spent more time in John or 1 John, but I will say this. This, I, I really encourage you to read the entire book several times. Read it in one sitting and set it aside and read it again in another setting. It's only 20 minutes. And, and just live into it. The different things that it says. Pay attention to the words, no, 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 you may know. The proofs that he gives and how you can know. All right? Any questions, comments, anything else to add? Gracious Heavenly Father, as we leave this place and go into the world around us, we pray that you would continue to surround us with your most intimidating angels. Give us the courage to step into places and moments of confidence in you. All for the purpose of God, that of living into the possibility of having assurance that we are yours and you are ours. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.